Hello everyone, it's a beautiful day today. It is a time that I cherish most, the time when we can get together and talk science. That's really who we are. We think of science as not a set of data, we think of science as, uh, as the way you think, as the way you look at the world that's within us and without us and uh, and you always are uncertain. You always are pushing on these boundaries. And, and, and for that, I thank you for joining us tonight for the 2021 Dean's Distinguished Research Lectureship and Wall of Scholarship Celebration. Last year, uh, I, like most of you, anticipated that we will be done with the with the virus, with uh, Alpha and Beta and Delta and then Omicron and all these little things, you know, that are traveling around and and that it will allow us to get together in person, which is ultimately who we are. We know who we are by how others relate to us, what others say. Uh, we know whether our science is any good about from from others, what others say about this. Do they publish it? Do they fund it? Do they like it? Do they take it from the basic science to clinics, is this possible that we can celebrate once a year the, the top mountaintops where air is clear and visibility beautiful uh, together. So we adapt, we adjust to realities of the situation of the, on the ground in the society in the, with the COVID pandemic and we work together to keep everyone safe. That's why the Zoom is here. I think that the, one of the most moving and defining things of the last year or so has been how the pandemic, as it, as it created its own ripples and tectonic shifts, how the researchers and scientists in our medical school continue to make remarkable progress in their work. Not everybody could, but somebody did. Somebody gloriously accomplished things that have been impossible even to imagine before. And uh, I'm deeply thankful to all of you that diverted your efforts to the COVID-19 or who have persisted in your line of research despite everything that has been happening. The commitment that you have to improving the understanding of the science that we use as a, as a substrate, as a tool. We know about medicine and we know about what to do in our operating rooms and in our clinics because of the science that you and others bring to the, to the labs and from the labs to the changing of the practice of medicine. So virtual or not, this night is one of the highlights of my year and I hope that you're gonna enjoy it as well. It's always an honor to recognize scholarship that has both withstood the test of time, that would be a definition of tradition, a definition of, uh, of something that is uh, repeatable and uh, uh, does not uh, degrade with time. And uh, that's what the wall of scholarship is looking at. And this year, we welcome a repeat honoree, Dr. Jose V. Pardo, a professor in the Department of Psychiatry, who has this paper as his second entry on that famous famous wall. When you consider that the requirement to be including on the wall is that the faculty member first or last authored paper must be cited at least 1,000 times on two of the three main citation indices, you will understand how remarkable that is. And that's where the paper we honor this year, the one that Dr. Pardo published in 1991 in Nature, entitled Localization of a human system for sustained attention by positron emission tomography is uh, so game-changing. It looks at the, uh, at the ways how you can anatomically distinguish a neural system that mediates sustained attention to sensory stimuli. And, 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 and he found that, and his team, that it is localized to the right side of the brain, something that has been previously inferred, but really not demonstrated. And we are about um, as all science is, about uh, being refutable. And uh, since the times of the uh, school, Lond uh, London School of Economics, you know, it has been one of the things that we are looking at. So in, in inferring inference, it's not the same as the demonstration. 
So the paper described elegantly how uh, we can use PET measurements of uh, the brain blood flow in healthy subjects to identify the changes in the regional brain activity during a simple visual or somatosensory tasks of sustained attention. That this remains critical in our understanding of the attention, how the physiology of it and the cellular and molecular biology works has been the fact that even after three decades, it was cited 16 times this year alone. So this is tradition, this is legacy, and this is influence, and this is remarkable achievement. Congratulations, Dr. Pardo, on attaining this honor for a second time, and thank you for your contributions to science. In tonight's Distinguished Research Lecture, we honor and have a pleasure of listening to two outstanding researchers, uh, Dr. Nikki Klatt, Director of the Division of Surgical Outcomes and Precision Medicine Research and a professor in the Department of Surgery, and Dr. Anna Selmetsky, Kavli Fellow of the National Academy of Sciences, and an assistant professor in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology. Tonight, they will share their important work, uh, the thinking they have put into that work, and you will see that there is a connection between the uh, two speakers and their uh, remarkable contribution to science. And I hope that you will enjoy that. So this is, this is I'd uh, like to show you, this is what they're gonna get. I cannot give it like now, but you can enjoy just the visual thing. And uh, you will hear them speak with the pitiless calcium of objectivity about their findings, but you will also see how is it that our medical school and our practice is moving in, uh, in possession of the goodwill and confidence of our fellow citizens in the state of Minnesota because of the science that's being generated by these two remarkable scholars. So please join me in watching this video introduction of Dr. Sklata Somatsky. Thank you. delighted to recruit Anna Selmaki a couple of years ago. She's particularly interested in uh, Candida albicans. It's a fungus that inhabits most of our bodies, in particular our gastrointestinal tract. And what she found as a graduate student, which is like really an iconic paper in the field, is that sometimes they uh, change the number of chromosomes that they have. And more recently in her work at Minnesota, she's shown that they take regions of the chromosome and amplify them. That is, they make many, many copies of certain parts of the chromosomes. And this enables it to develop resistance to common antifungal drugs. As a practicing infectious disease uh, physician, I see patients with Canada infections that are very difficult to treat, and her work holds promise to lead to new ways to treat this frequently deadly infection. She's a terrific example uh, of the kind of work uh, that's going to lead to advances in infectious diseases, and we hope eventually to the prevention and better treatment um, for these life-threatening and other kinds of infections that, uh, that we are now confronting and will have to confront in the future. Anna was a graduate student in my lab, one of the best graduate students I ever had in my lab, and we had a wonderful time. She got a lot done, and um, some of her work, as I said, was very groundbreaking, and, and her, her science paper on aneuploidy is still one of the classics in the field. Dr. Clad is um, a relatively new and very welcome addition to the Department of Surgery. She brings with her an expertise in the microbiome and the effects of microbiome on disease. 
I think a most interesting aspect of her work uh, focuses on pharmacomicrobiomics, or the ability of the bacteria that live within us to metabolize or break down drugs that are used to treat uh, microbial infection. And it's that she's so smart that she asks the right questions, she does the right experiments, she's got boundless enthusiasm, she's extraordinarily collaborative, which is good for me because I like to work with her. They use uh, big data or, or cutting edge genomic technologies to inform more reductionist in vitro experiments that, that get at mechanism. And I think this, both this top down and bottom up approach towards the study of how our microbiome metabolizes drugs and how that impacts clinical outcomes is truly an innovative approach to, to tackling some really important scientific questions. She's enormous fun. She has a great sense of humor. She's just a pleasure to spend time with. Also on another level, we end up talking science all the time because she's so smart. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome, colleagues, to the second year of the Dean's Distinguished Research Lectureship um, at, uh, uh, in, in the virtual edition. Um, the way we're going to do this, we'll have a question and answer session after each of the two presentations. Um, please use the question and answer function um, on the, um, uh, the, at the bottom panel on the right. Please don't use the um, uh, chat uh, version to ask your question. Um, so without further ado, it is my honor to uh, introduce our first speaker, my friend Nikki Klatt, whose lecture is entitled Mechanisms Underlying Microbiome Influence on Human Disease. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here today. And I'd first like to thank Dean Toller and Vice Dean Shacker for the extreme honor to give this lecture today. So I was asked to give a little background on myself. So I'm actually a Minnesota native. While I've only been at the University of Minnesota since April of 2020, when my lab moved right in time for a Minnesota shutdown due to COVID, we um, actually have roots here in Minnesota. So I grew up in Chaska. You can see here me in the middle with a fishing pole and a dog on a dock, as many Minnesota girls grew up. And I went to Chaska High School, where I first found my love for science. Uh, fortunately, being in the state of Minnesota, I was able to take advantage of post-secondary enrollment options, where I left my junior year of high school to attend college full-time at the University of Minnesota here in the Twin Cities, as well as Normandale Community College, and get two years of college credits while I was in high school to jumpstart my um, scientific career. I did my undergraduate work at the University of Minnesota Duluth where I got my bachelor in biology and minor in chemistry and first started working in microbiology labs. I of course had my last year of undergrad in the coldest winter on record for 90 years where Lake Superior froze over, which led to me only applying to graduate school in the South. So my next stop was Emory University in Atlanta where I joined the immunology and molecular pathogenesis program to get my PhD. Halfway through my PhD, my graduate mentor, Guido Silvestri, moved to the University of Pennsylvania. So I followed him there, where I finished my PhD. After my PhD, I went on to the National Institutes of Health for my postdoc, where I joined Jason Brenchley's lab in the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. And this is where I really started studying the microbiome and mucosal immunology in the context of HIV. After four years at the NIH, I decided to go across the country all the way up to the Pacific Northwest where I started my first lab at the University of Washington in Seattle. Now I joined the Department of Pharmaceutics there, which was a little weird for a microbiologist and immunologist, but it becomes very important as we'll see in my talk later. After five and a half years at UW, moved the laboratory to University of Miami, where I wanted to work more with the cohorts of women that are highly vulnerable to HIV infection down in Miami. But after just two years at the University of Miami, I was up here visiting my parents when I had the serendipitous lunch with Dr. Tim Shacker, and he brought Dr. Saeed Ikramuddin, the chair of the Department of Surgery in, and they jointly recruited me to the University of Minnesota. 
So while I wasn't planning to leave the beach for the tundra, I am extremely happy I did, and I'm very thankful to be here today giving this lecture. So I couldn't have done it, though, without my lab, so I want to start out by thanking everybody. So pictures of my lab, both um, present on the left here and past, both in Miami and Seattle. And you'll see there's a few of them that were along for the ride, and sp specifically my research scientist, Courtney Broadlow, Joined the lab in Seattle, moved to Miami, and moved to Minnesota. So we have some long haulers in the group. Several came from Miami as well, including uh, Assistant Professor Luca Schifanella. So what we study in my lab is the microbiome. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, the microbiome is microorganisms in an environment. So there's 10 to 100 trillion microorganisms per person. I like to say the fun dinner party fact that the average adult has 5 to 10 pounds of bacteria in their gut. But it's not just bacteria that make up the microbiome. It also includes viruses, parasites, fungi, protists, archaea. And it's also the genes, metabolites, and products. So these microorganisms are extremely active and, as we'll see later, extremely important for metabolism and byproducts. I also want to introduce you to the word dysbiosis, which is an imbalance of a microbial community. And this can be either a change in abundance or functional changes to a microorganism in a certain community. And importantly, when dysbiosis occurs, it's highly associated with multiple diseases. Now, there are several microbiomes in the body. The best known is the GI tract, where the majority of the bugs reside and are highly associated with things like colon cancer, diabetes, even down to weight loss and gain. However, we are going to focus on the female reproductive tract today. Um, my lab likes to study this model of microbial dysbiosis because it's extremely important in multiple systems, whether it's systemic inflammation and mucosal dysfunction or immunity inflammatory responses. These all have a circular role that can lead to disease outcomes. And in the context of today's talk, we'll be talking about HIV. So like I said, we're going to focus on women today, and that's because women are extremely important in the HIV pandemic. So every minute, two women are infected with HIV, which is a staggering statistic, and we think it's probably getting higher during COVID. Women are particularly vulnerable as well, as they, in the areas where they have the highest HIV rates, there's also the highest levels of sexual violence and lack of sexual negotiation rights. Indeed, in places like Sub-Saharan Africa, where we're seeing the majority of new HIV infections in women, there's two times as many girls between the ages of 15 and 24 being newly HIV infected as there are men of the same age. Also, it's important because we have the issue with pregnancy and mother-to-child transmission. So not only can a woman be affected by HIV, but can then, of course, pass this on to her children, especially in lower-income countries, such as Africa. So the goal of my lab is really to understand what biological mechanisms lead to HIV acquisition in the context of this talk we'll be talking about in women. So this is just a cartoon demonstrating some of the putative mechanisms associated with HIV infection in women. So on the left-hand side of the slide, you'll see a healthy female reproductive tract, where in the vagina you have a squamous epithelium that should be intact, preventing pathogens to cross. You have homeostatic cells and cytokines that maintain a healthy epithelial barrier and then will protect against pathogens that might get across. And then hopefully you have an optimal microbiome, which we'll talk a lot more about. On the right side of the screen, you see these different mechanisms that can underlie increased HIV infection in women, including pro-inflammatory cells and cytokines that can cause inflammation and damage to that tight epithelial barrier. In addition, there's an altered microbiome, which we'll really focus on, that can also cause damage to the tight epithelial barrier, and we'll talk about why. So this is kind of a 36,000-foot view of what bacterial vaginosis or vaginal microbial dysbiosis looks like. So on the left-hand side, you have lactobacillus, which is the optimal microbiome in the woman's vagina, where you have a very low pH. This Nugent score is going to be zero. It's only lactobacillus dominant, so only this one microbe. And this is very protective against pathogens. It's better for um, protection against STIs. It's better for birth rates and, decre and associated with decreased premature birth as well. However, on the right side, when you get dominance by polymicrobial anaerobic bacteria, we call this bacterial vaginosis, or BV. This is associated with these anaerobic bugs, such as Gardnerella, Mobiluncus, Prevotella, Adipobium. It's associated with an increased pH. And there's also associated with inflammation and barrier damage 
both of which can then be le lead to increased HIV infection in women. What is very important here is there is no effective treatment for BV. Metronidazole is the key antibiotic used to treat BV, but after a month, 50% of women recur, and after a year, 90% of women recur after metronidazole treatment. It is so important to study BV in the context of HIV because it is consistently associated with increased HIV transmission. On the left side here, in the fresh cohort in South Africa, run by Doug Kwan's group, we see from CT1, which is lactobacillus dominant, up to CT4, which is the most diverse polymicrobial vaginal environment, there is increased HIV transmission with more polymicrobial vaginal microbiota. On the right-hand side is a meta-analysis of multiple studies showing HIV transmission that have BV measured in the study, and it was shown that women who have BV had a three times higher risk of getting HIV infected than women who had lactobacillus dominance. We really wanted to understand the impact of this on HIV transmission, and we started thinking about PrEP, or pre-exposure prophylaxis, which is when people take antiretroviral drugs to prevent HIV. So in men, PrEP is about 70 to 90 percent efficacious, depending on the study. However, as you can see here, in multiple studies in women, you have anywhere from negative 49 percent to 39 percent on the bottom uh, efficacy, and the highest efficacy you see is those top three from 66 to 75 percent. However, those are in women who have partners that they know are HIV infected and are being counseled, so that is best case scenario. So it's much lower rates of efficacy for PrEP in women than it is for men, and we really wanted to understand whether there was biological mechanisms that might underlie this. So we studied the Caprisa 004 Tenofovir gel PrEP trial, which was done in South Africa, and women were given a 1% Tenofovir gel that was used um, intravaginally pre or post sex to prevent HIV. As you can see in their science paper back in 2010, the overall efficacy in this trial was 39% in all women. So we had 688 cervical vaginal lavage samples from this trial, and in collaboration with Adam Bergener, who's now at Case Western University, we measured the microbiome in these women, and you can see on the left, you have this Gardnerella vaginalis dominant polymicrobial communities, which of the, would be the BV-like communities. And on the right, you have this lactobacillus dominant communities, which of course is what our ideal community would be. So we refer to this as less than 50% lactobacillus or more than 50% lactobacillus through the rest of the talk. We then took these women and split them into groups based on whether they were lactobacillus dominant on top, or not lactobacillus dominant on bottom. And for the first time ever, we demonstrated there was a difference in efficacy based on the vaginal microbiome that was present. So women who had lactobacillus dominant had 61% efficacy uh, in this Tenofovir gel prep. Whereas women who did not have lactobacillus dominance, who had this BV-like state, had only 18% efficacy, so much lower efficacy than even shown in the whole trial. And this is the first time that it's been associated with that vaginal microbiome. So we really wanted to understand why. Now this is where it gets really important that I was in the Department of Pharmaceutics, because I had a very talented grad student in the lab, Ryan Chu, who got his PhD in pharmaceutics with my group. And he wanted to ask the question of how bacteria might metabolize drugs. Now this is called pharmacomicrobiomics. It's been studied for a long time in the pharmaceutical industry, but academic research has largely ignored this concept. So this is where the actual bacteria can metabolize a drug, leaving it ineffective, and sometimes, in the case of something like digoxin, even toxic. So we asked the question, are vaginal bacteria capable of metabolizing antiretroviral drugs? And in the context of this study, specifically drugs used for PrEP in women. So what we found is that tenofovir is rapidly depleted by Gardnerella, but not lactobacillus. So Gardnerella is part of one of these main BV drugs, and what you can see on the left is the red line going down. That's tenofovir in the presence of Gardnerella, so it's rapidly lost, whereas in the blue lines are lactobacillus or the abiotic control in black, you do not see a loss of tenofovir. 
We also looked at the metabolite formation. So we could predict what metabolites would be made by the breakdown or metabolism of tenofovir. And we find that adenine, the main byproduct of metabolism of tenofovir, is increased in the presence of Gardnerella, meaning that this is true metabolism. So it's not just degradation, but the bacteria is actually taking the drug and metabolizing it into another byproduct. So this was all in vitro, just samples that we had bacteria in the drugs, but we wanted to move into using primary samples from women. So we got cervical vaginal lavage samples from 29 BV negative and 15 BV positive women in Miami. And then we measured the microbiomes by 16S RNA and did these co-cultures with target cells for HIV, as well as different drugs that are either used for PrEP or upcoming for PrEP, which we'll go through individually. So tenofovir, what we just talked about, um, we first measured, and we're looking at it a little differently now. So in this graph, you have each line represents an individual woman, and each color represents different bacteria, with orange bacteria being that optimal lactobacillus, and then where you can see the blue and the pink and the green, this is this polymicrobial BV-like environment. And we have ordered these from left to right, and the amount of degradation. Um, that occurs of tenofovir. And what you can clearly see is that if you have lactobacillus dominance, you have very little degradation, but the degradation increases with the polymicrobial flora. This is shown um, even more so quantified where we're looking now at tenof tenofovir diphosphate, which is the pharmacologically active form of tenofovir. And we look at this intracellularly and you can see that women who had less than 50% lactobacillus, so this is a BRBV women, have much less tenofovir diphosphate, so much less pharmacologically active tenofovir than women who are lactobacillus dominant. And when we look at the rate of degradation of tenofovir relative to the percent of lactobacillus, there's a significant negative correlation. So this really gives us a new mechanism for the lack of PrEP efficacy in women. We next went on to look at depivirine, which is a up and coming PrEP drug, and they're putting this in a vaginal ring. So this is extremely important because if the ring is sitting in the vagina, so this is like a Nuva ring that sits in the vagina and then releases low levels of depivirine. But if it's constantly exposed to the bacteria, it can constantly be broken down. So it was really important to understand if the bacteria can metabolize depivirine. So again here, we have left to right from the rate of degradation. And again, you can see that the degradation is vastly increased with the high diversity microbiomes, whereas there's very little degradation in women who have lactobacillus dominance, again, quantified here on the right. Again, when we look at the rate of degradation relative to lactobacillus, we see a significant negative correlation, indicating, again, that this BV-like state leads to increased degradation of depivirine. We next went on to look at tenofovir alphenamide, which is TAF, and this is a next generation PrEP candidate. It's a derivative of tenofovir, but is more rapidly absorbed into cells. So here we again order this across, and what you see is there is no order to this degradation, and that is because TAF is not degraded. So this is very good news that maybe one of these drugs or some of these drugs are not degraded and we see no degradation of TAF um, of the pharmacologically active tenofovir diphosphate and accordingly we see no correlation with lactobacillus. So this brings us back to our putative mechanisms underlying increased HIV transmission in women. And we know that inflammation and barrier damage can be associated with increased HIV transmission, but now we have a new source, this antiretroviral drug metabolism, that might also increase the rate of HIV transmission and decrease PrEP efficacy. So to conclude, dysbiosis of vaginal bacteria is a key factor in vaginal inflammation, epithelial barrier integrity, and HIV acquisition. These dysbiotic bacteria can metabolize the PrEP drugs tenofovir and depivirine, and this could potentially contribute to decreased PrEP efficacy. But TAF is not degraded by vaginal bacteria and will be very important to get TAF approved for use in women as it's only used or only approved for use in men right now. And this does give considerations for a more efficacious PrEP. While there are multiple factors that lead to efficacy of PrEP, this could absolutely be one that contributes highly. But overall, we just really need to better understand the vaginal microbiome and how to increase lactobacillus communities and better treat bacterial vaginosis and decrease recurrence of bacterial vaginosis to improve efficacy of HIV prevention drugs as well as overall women's health. 
And lastly, we are now thinking and doing a lot of work with the role of ARV metabolism by bacteria in HIV-infected individuals. So since we know bacteria can metabolize these antiretroviral drugs, what impact might this have on viral reservoirs and chronic HIV pathogenesis? So we have a new study being planned that we're working closely with Dr. Shacker's group, where we're looking at HIV-infected individuals and looking at gut bacteria and how the microbiome might contribute not only to inflammation and immune responses that are in chronic inflammation and pathogenesis in HIV, but also to decrease antiretroviral drug levels in HIV-infected individuals. So this is up and coming. Finally, I want to go back to our lab here, and we have an amazing team that is really fortunate to be at the University of Minnesota with so many amazing researchers and collaborators. And we really use this kind of model of inflammation, microbial dysbiosis, and immunity. And now we have this other factor of drug metabolism. And we study multiple factors now. So we have a lot of exciting studies coming up relative to women's health. We're doing a lot of sepsis and surgical outcomes, which is my division. We are looking at cancer and transplants in the Department of Surgery, a lot of COVID-19 work, of course, and other infectious diseases, including Zika, and then antibiotics and antibiotic resistance. So a lot of exciting stuff coming up, and we're really, really happy to be here and working with so many talented individuals. So we'd just like to thank everybody um, in my lab. Uh, again, Luca Schifanella is an assistant professor that works very closely with me and helps me run this lab. Um, and then everybody in the lab, a lot of the work I showed here was done by Andrew Gustin, who just got his PhD and is a University of Washington student that has stuck with me over the years. And um, Ryan Chu, who got his PhD in my lab and has now moved on. Um, Adam Bergener, Case Western, Caprisa, all of the trial participants, um, and of course all of my collaborators and the cores at the University of Minnesota, and of course all of the funding um, from the NIH. And then finally, just want to end with the true reason I moved back to Minnesota. And as tonight is the Vikings game, let's go Vikes. Thank you so much for your attention and happy to take questions. Nikki, that was great. Um, while we're, and again, if anybody wants to ask a question, just please use the Q&A function in the lower right of the screen. But while we're waiting for that, something I've wondered about, um, do we have any evidence that, um, whether it's HIV drugs or other, that there is altered metabolism in, from the gut um, uh, affecting drug function? So that's a wonderful question. And there is evidence in other diseases. Um, Andrew Goodman at Yale has done a lot of work on this um, and that we know gut bugs can metabolize over 70% of drugs are exposed to. So we know this is probably something that's affecting many different diseases, not just HIV. And then in my own lab, we're working really hard. So, um, and I didn't mention them in this talk, but uh, Chris Bastian and uh, Jonas Wright Miller, who are new additions in Minnesota in my lab, are really spearheading a lot of great work on trying to understand the metabolism of different HIV drugs and different drugs like transplant drugs like Dracolimus that, um, and how the gut microbiome might metabolize them. So this is really where we're going with this field because we think this might impact the efficacy of many drugs. And I, so I'm just going to ask one last question because I've always been curious about this. The, the, you know, in, in the world of infectious disease with uh, varying antibiotic levels and the inability sometimes to actually treat an infection with antibiotics, is there any evidence right now that this mechanism is one of the reasons why we can't get adequate drug levels into infections and tissues? I think it might be a very big part of this. And so, and it's, again, something that we have to understand better. And there's certain drugs that probably are affected more, but anything that has to really go through the gut and get um, integrated in and might hit those microbiota, or the microbiota could be impacted. We know even antibiotics themselves can be directly impacted and potentially metabolized by the microbiota. So this is a mechanism that might not just affect the drugs that we're treating with, but even the drugs that we use to treat the bugs. So it's there's multiple la layers of this and it is a really hot topic. So it's exciting to be kind of on the forefront of this. So um, another question, has any work been considered to genetically manipulate bacteria to enhance production of active HIV medication metabolites? That is a wonderful idea. There is work being done to genetically manipulate bacteria and to 
do this in a form um, where they can make drugs or other, you know, homeostatic mechanisms. We thought at one point about them making IL-22 to improve barrier function, but not that I know of is anything actually currently underway um, that, it, that is potentially treatment right now, but I think it's a great idea and a good place to look next. And I think that's a really good segue also into Anna's talk, because that's where she's doing a lot of really interesting work. Excellent. Well, again, thank you very much. That was an outstanding talk. And we will move on now to uh, Anna Selmicki um, <clears throat> and the science of fungi. Um, the lecture is entitled Genome Plasticity Drives Drug Resistance in Fungal Pathogens. Thank you, Dr. Shacker and Dean Toller for this incredible opportunity. I'm really humbled and honored to be among the other distinguished lecturers, including my partner tonight, Nikki Klatt. As a first-generation college student and a graduate of the University of Minnesota PhD program in molecular, cellular, developmental biology and genetics, I'm really proud of what my lab has accomplished in the last six years, especially since returning to the university in late 2019. I'm grateful to my mentors, collaborators, and colleagues that have helped get me here today. And none of, you, none of it would be possible without the enthusiasm and teamwork of my past and current trainees. So now I'm excited to tell you about some of our research on genome plasticity and drug resistance in human fungal pathogens. My lab studies diverse opportunistic fungal pathogens that make up the human mycobiome. Today I will highlight our research on Canada species, which are the most common cause of fungal infections worldwide. These commensal organisms are commonly found within the gut and mucous membranes in healthy individuals. The most common fungal pathogen, uh, Candida albicans, is the fourth most common nosocomial infection and causes nearly 500,000 life-threatening infections annually, primarily in hospitalized and immune-compromised individuals. When a disseminated bloodstream infection of Candida albicans occurs, the mortality rate is very high, near 60%, and this is despite available modern antifungal therapies. The failure of these antifungal drugs is likely multi multifactorial and is compounded by the fact that these drugs are often fungistatic, not fungicidal. Drug-resistant candida species are now recognized by the CDC as a serious threat. This makes infections much even harder to treat, and primarily this is because we only have three classes of antifungal drugs available. Currently, approximately 7% of Canada bloodstream infections are resistant to these antifungal drugs. Additionally, the recent emergence of Canada auris poses an urgent threat level because unlike other Canada species, Canada auris spreads easily within healthcare settings and is often resistant to both first and second line antifungal drugs. And for the first time, a very small number of these clinical isolates have been identified as pan-drug resistant. Critically, the evolution of drug resistance, including multi-drug resistance, can occur during prolonged antifungal therapy within the hospital. Yet the mechanism and dynamics of acquired drug resistance are not fully understood, which is why our question is what mechanisms are driving this resistance. The emergence of Candida auris is what originally sparked a really wonderful collaboration with Dr. Susan Klein and Dr. Saren Ariel. We are leveraging their expertise in epidemiology and on patient care with our expertise in fungal genomics in order to determine several things. What is the extent of nosocomial transmission of diverse Candida species, including potentially Candida auris, using whole genome sequencing and molecular fingerprinting? Additionally, we want to characterize the mechanisms that are causing acquired drug resistance in patient isolates. And finally, we are going to identify patient and environmental risk factors for candidemia. These types of collaborations are exactly why I'm excited to be here at the University of Minnesota Medical School. In addition to working with, directly with clinical isolates of candidemia, my lab is also utilizing both controlled in vitro and in vivo evolutionary systems to study the evolution of drug resistance in both a rigorous and reproducible format. For these experiments, we start with a drug sensitive clinical isolate and then passage that isolate either in the presence or absence of antifungal drug in a tissue culture system or in a mouse model. We then use comprehensive phenotypic and genomic assays to comprehensively identify all types of adaptive changes 
that occurred during antifungal drug exposure. We have also developed comprehensive genomics and bioinformatic pipelines to rapidly analyze these genomes in real time. Using this strategy, we have performed thousands of parallel evolution experiments, and that's primarily what I will focus on telling you about today. I first got fascinated with genomics during my PhD research here at the University of Minnesota with Judy Berman. At that time, I got to learn about how to print homemade microarrays on the St. Paul campus using PCR products that Judy's lab had generated from the Canada albicans genome. As an asexual fungus, Canada albicans generates somatic genome mutations and rearrangements that encompass the full spectrum of mutations found in human cancer cells. This is what led me to my postdoctoral research at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, where I was able to further leverage fungal genomics in order to understand genome rearrangements, including polyploidy, that occur in 37% of cancers. Additionally, because of this early genomics expertise in Judy's lab, I was offered a TA position at the three-week molecular mycology course at the Marine Biological Laboratory. This course was started 25 years ago by leaders in the medical mycology field, including University of Minnesota Emeritus Professor Dr. Pete McGee. This course offered an environment that fosters training, interaction, and exchange of ideas among students, faculty, and the greater mycology research community. So these connections and supportive community is why I'm still invested and excited about fungal genomics. Our research and that of others supports that genome plasticity can drive adaptation to antifungal drugs in diverse fungi. For example, whole genome duplication resulting in polyploidy can promote antifungal drug resistance in both Candida and Cryptococcus species. During my postdoctoral work, we also found that genome duplication can increase the rate and spectrum of adaptive mutations that fungi acquire during adaptation to stress. Similarly, aneuploidy, gain or loss of a whole chromosome, can cause antifungal drug resistance in just about every fungal pathogen we've analyzed. We've also shown that aneuploidy in Candida albicans can promote colonization within the mouse model of infection. Additionally, loss of heterozygosity can occur in heterozygous diploid organisms like Candida albicans and can cause drug resistance via homozygosis of a beneficial resistance allele. Finally, the story I will tell you about today is our new identification of a mechanism in Canada albicans that results in accordion-like copy number expansions in the presence of antifungal drug. This research was really driven by my first graduate student, Dr. Robert Todd. Rob performed thousands of parallel evolution experiments in the presence of the azole antifungal drug fluconazole, which is the most commonly prescribed antifungal drug. Fluconazole is orally available and easy to administer with very little side effects, but it is fungostatic and resistance to the azole class of drugs is again listed as a serious threat level by the CDC. Fluconazole acts by inhibiting production of ergosterol, the fungal equivalent of cholesterol, and also causes cell membrane stress. Throughout my talk, I will present our whole genome sequencing data using a program developed here at the University of Minnesota by Judy Berman's lab called YMAP. In this example, whole genome sequence read depth is plotted as a function of chromosome position, and the y-axis represents chromosome copy number. Again, Candida albicans is a heterozygous diploid organism, therefore the baseline on this graph is 2. If whole chromosome aneuploidy occurs, the copy number will increase, in this case, across the entire chromosome, like this example of aneuploidy of chromosome 5. When Rob started to sequence his fluconazole-evolved isolates, he identified many recurrent, segmental, or partial chromosome amplification events, like this one on chromosome 5. We have previously shown that this particular segmental aneuploidy is an isochromosome structure and causes drug resistance by increasing gene copy number of two very important genes, TAC1 and ERG11. These genes encode the target of the azole drug and a transcription factor that controls drug efflux pumps. Therefore, a, this segmental aneuploidy acts as a very large effect mutation. Importantly, these segmental aneuploidies share a common feature. The breakpoint where the amplification occurs is at the centromere of chromosome 5, which is flanked by a long inverted repeat sequence. Using this information, we then sought to identify 
all long repeat sequences throughout the Canada Albicans genome and compare these to positions of genome rearrangements to as in clinical isolates and evolved isolates as possible. This was done in collaboration with Tyler Wyckoff, an undergraduate in the lab, and our collaborator Anya Forsch. This map is showing where many of these repeat sequences are found throughout the Canada Albicans genome and identifies that there are regions of the genome with lots of repetitive sequences as well as repeat poor regions. In addition to Rob's in vitro experiments, Annette Beach in our lab collaborated with Anya Forsch and Scott Filler to identify genome rearrangements that were occurring in an oral pharyngeal candidiasis mouse model. This was done in the absence of antifungal drug selection. Yet the genome rearrangements that we observed, again, copy number changes along different chromosomes, like chromosome two and chromosome three, always occurred with breakpoints at these long repeat sequences. So what this suggests is that in the mouse model, as well as in the presence or absence of antifungal drug, these repeat sequences are hotspots for genome plasticity. For the remainder of my talk, I'm gonna focus on a novel type of uh, copy number variation that we identified. In this case, um, what we started with were two different drug susceptible progenitor isolates. Each has a completely euploid genome with two copies of every chromosome. But after 100 generations, again in the presence of this antifungal drug fluconazole, the isolates that we identified had very surprising copy number changes uh, that occurred within chromosomes, in this case, chromosome one and chromosome four. These complex CNVs can increase the copy number of very large regions of the genome to over nine copies per genome. When we zoomed in on each of these complex CNVs, we observed that there were two copy number breakpoints located on each side of the CNV, generating a stair-step amplification event on the left and a stair-step amplification event again on the right. Each one of these copy number breakpoints occurs at one of our previously identified long repeat sequences, shown here in blue and orange. This amplified a 100 kb region nine times within this genome, which is a massive amplification. Importantly, each side of the complex CNV was associated with a different repeat sequence. These complex CNVs promote drug resistance. When we analyze the growth kinetics of this CNV relative to the progenitor, in the presence of fluconazole, we can see that the complex CNV has a significant benefit. And actually, to our amazement, there is no difference in the fitness between these two strains in the absence of the, of the drug fluconazole, meaning that there's no fitness cost to the Canada albicans cell for carrying around all this extra DNA. We see a similar finding in all strains with complex CNVs identified to date, and they have all have increased fitness in the presence of drug. Here's a different example. This complex CNV is on chromosome three. Importantly, we've identified the gene that we think is causing multi-drug resistance in these isolates. This gene is MRR1, which encodes a transcriptional regulator of the multi-drug efflux pump MDR1. And consistent with this, all the isolates that we've identified with this recurrent CNV consistently are displayed multi-azole resistance. Other genes within these complex CNVs may also be playing a role in drug resistance and molecular confirmation is ongoing. So I've showed you several examples of these complex CNVs and what we found is that this genome instability is rapidly expandable like an accordion in the presence of drug and rapidly reversible in the absence of drug. What I'm showing in this video is a montage of many single cells undergoing chromosome amplification events and loss in just 24 to 48 hours on an auger plate. We, used, we also used minion long rate sequencing and karyotype analysis to show that this dynamic genome instability is generated in some cases by dicentric chromosome formation. And it's these dicentric chromosomes that are unstable and generate rapid genomic instability via a breakage fusion bridge cycle. But what does this mean for the treatment of Candida albicans infections in clinical settings? These CNVs may underlie phenotypes that we have seen in clinical isolates, including heteroresistance. So what does this mean for the treatment of Candida albicans infections in clinical settings? Well, we do have evidence that dicentric chromosome formation is occurring even in clinical isolates. That was reported in 2006. And we think that these types of genome 
rearrangements and this genome plasticity is underlying clinical phenotypes that are well described, including hetero resistance that can kind of come and go in certain isolates. And so additional work is needed to understand the mechanisms that are causing this genome plasticity in Candida albicans and other Candida species. I'm grateful to so many people that have helped get me here today. And I'll start first with the undergraduate research experience that got me into research and considering research as a career path. I would like to thank Dr. Chris Schaller at the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University. I also want to acknowledge the Hormel Institute in my hometown, Austin, Minnesota, for providing me with one of my first full-time research experiences. Similarly, I would like to add a shout out to the programs that have supported undergraduate researchers here in my lab at the University of Minnesota, the TRIO McNair, Directed Research, and the UROP programs, so thank you. Additionally, I wanna thank Dr. Judy Berman and my experience at the MBL. The training environment that Judy fostered in her lab was phenomenal, and I'm really grateful for the mentorship and community uh, that she generated. And now I'm honored that I'm able to return to the MBL as an instructor in the Molecular Mycology course, where I'm teaching the very first modules on bioinformatics and genomics of fungal pathogens. Additionally, I want to acknowledge the many fabulous colleagues in the microbiology and immunology department and across the university. I wanna thank these friends and colleagues because they've all helped me establish my research here at the University of Minnesota and provide support throughout the pandemic. Some of these colleagues are part of a weekly grant writing group, Janelle, Will, and Ryan. Some of them are fungal pathogen and genomics experts, Frank, Dana, and Kirsten, and my mentoring team, Ryan, Kirsten, and Sandy. There are many more of you, and I'm grateful for your support. And, and finally, I wanna thank the Center for Women in Medicine and Science here at the University of Minnesota for their early Pathways to Career Success program. Thank you all. None of this would be possible without the enthusiasm and teamwork from my past and current trainees. Thank you all. I would like to acknowledge the support from the NSF, NIH, and the Burles Welcome Fund as well. I'm really humbled and honored to be here tonight, and I look forward to your questions. Anna, that was fantastic. Um, <clears throat> while we're waiting for more questions to come in, I do have uh, one, is there any evidence for this mechanism of resistance in other pathogens, in particular fungal pathogens or, or other bacteria? Yeah, absolutely. My colleague upstairs, Kirsten Nielsen, studies Cryptococcus neoformans and its ability to undergo massive genome amplification events. So that's polyploidization. We know that that can happen during entry into the human host. So there are triggers that we don't really understand yet that are driving these phenomenon um, just within um, the human um, body and immune system. Uh, similarly, there are other candida species, um, including candida auris now that we've identified that can undergo copy number changes, both small and large. And uh, they seem to do this very rapidly, like within the time that uh, an organism would be, um, uh, that, sorry, within the time that a patient would be treated with an antifungal in the hospital. Thank you. Is there, can you imagine what, what you could do to overcome this mechanism of resistance? Yeah, this is, this is kind of uh, the, the catch-22. So it, if we throw a new drug at these strains, they might simply just adapt to that, that new drug. Um, the idea would be, could we, first of all, identify the mechanisms that are promoting uh, these really rapid changes whether it's um, you know, chromosome stability or, or sort of membrane stress that's, that's driving this instability um, and, and then treat that as well. Um, one idea that's come up in, in the literature is to generate something like um, an evolutionary trap. Perhaps you treat with an antifungal drug, we know that these organisms will, will generate a specific aneuploidy and then we treat it with a different drug that specifically targets those aneuploid cells. And so that's um, been shown to work at least um, in the literature. And I think it's um, something that, that we might have to consider. Um, is it known what controls the activity of the MRR1 regulator or MD1 gene transcription? What controls the transcriptional regulator? That's a great question. Um, I, 
I don't remember, but it, it, it's possible it has actually, um, there are some drug response elements that are upstream of several of these um, key drug resistance genes. Um, but other than that, um, I believe it's unknown. You had mentioned, um, or you gave examples of how uh, drug pressure promotes this, uh, but you also mentioned that, that you observe it in the absence of drug pressure. Can you comment on that? Yeah, so what I'll say is that we see different changes uh, depending on the environment uh, that is selecting for the change. So in the absence of drug, for example, even in the mouse model, um, we'll still see changes, but they're often not the same changes that we see in the presence of drug. So it's likely that these copy number changes are impacting virulence or dissemination within the host in ways that are um, also promoting viability of the organism. But then when we, in the presence of drug, we're selecting for drug response elements and, and amplification of the drug target, things like that. Okay. Well, um, we're at time, oh, wait a minute. Um, when CNVs that span a centromere, presumably via homologous recombination between inverted repeats, are excised when the drug is withdrawn, are they maintained as stable episodes that might reintegrate later under renewed antifungal pressure? Yeah, that's a lovely question. We're trying to investigate that as we speak, looking for uh, what, the, what the question is asking is, um, extracellular or extra chromosomal amplification events. We know that for sure some of these events are actually um, chromosomal expansions. And so those are accordions that just kind of expand the chromosome and contract. Uh, but our guess is absolutely that some of these might be popping out due to homologous recombination. And that's been identified in, in lots of cancer cells as well. So oh. if we could identify that mechanism in fungi, it'd be really exciting. Fascinating. Well, again, thank you very much. That was a wonderful talk. Um, we are at time. So um, I'd like to thank all of you who came tonight and listened to the presentations and asked great questions. Um, and I am really hopeful that next year we'll see you all in person uh, and can enjoy some um, uh, uh, reception afterwards as we have done in the past. So with that, I'll say thank you and good night. <laughs>